to my countdown, guys. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> word. Hello, everyone. It is Sunday, and you are so welcome at Love Key Church. Give yourselves a round of applause for being in church Yay. in the holidays. Come on. I would love to know who is here for the first time. Please raise your hands. Any first timers? Hey, Tani Krista. Who else? Who else is there? <laughs> Nobody. All second time coming. Oh, da. I can see. You love Maggi. You can see this is in the eyes, no? Well done. Welcome to Love Key Church. Also, everybody online, welcome. We love to have you here. My verse of the day that I want to share is the verse of the day yesterday. Um, it's not not applicable anymore because it was the verse of the day yesterday. The word is applicable every day, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Do you agree? Okay, so it says, though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. And we are going to rejoice in the Lord today, in the God of our salvation. We welcome the Holy Spirit our guest of honor in this house. We are going to have an awesome time of worship, and I believe the sermon is going to knock us all out as well. Over Amen. To you. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag no pressure. Lots of pressure. Okay. Good <laughs> morning. Good morning, Amen. everybody. How are you doing? Bam kile kile. Welcome to church. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us from wherever you came today and wherever you are online. It's so great to, for you. To, it's so great for you to be with us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm. So, I'm so glad you're here. We are excited for what God wants to do today in our midst. We uh, had an amazing time in God's presence last week. Amen. Who was here last week Woo! with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? It was Amen. incredible. We are expectant for that to just grow and grow Amen. and grow in our midst. Amen. Amen. Awesome. We, uh, I just want to quickly run through a few announcements, especially for the new people here. We'd love for you to follow us on um, Instagram and Facebook. I often get people that send me direct messages and say where do you meet and what time it's all there it's all on the website it's all you can follow us on the website lovekeymission.com or go to instagram or facebook it's very easy love key church just look for love key church you'll find it there please subscribe to the podcast and make sure that you write a review it's a great way for us to spread the word to even more people and you for you to go back and listen to all the messages that we've done we love celebrating birthdays and anniversaries and in this past two weeks we had a literally a new birth yeah um baby what's the baby's name again gabriella, gabriella was born yeah uh, we have the uncle here today the father and, and, the, and aunt. the aunt yeah. and the, the father will hopefully join us again soon uh, but they are you know practicing how to not sleep a lot uh so but let's so we'll sing for gabriella who else has a birthday coming up yes this week yes any birthdays Come on, don't be shy. Okay. Any anniversaries? Yeah. Yay, Perry. Oh, and I'd make say gister. Wesley Lila was gister. Wow. Anyone else? Well Another done. We're just putting up your hand for fun. <laughs> oh, you actually have an anniversary. That's a lot of anniversaries. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do a happy birthday and a happy anniversary. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Gabriella. Happy birthday to you. And then this one, we don't normally play, we just sing. Happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Yay! Well done, well done. In this world where marriages are breaking up, I want to say well done and Amen. keep going. God is with you. Amen. We want to invite you to be part of our connect groups. Church is not just coming together on Sunday. It's doing life together. And connect groups is a great way for you to extend your experience of being part of the family of God. It's where we talk more about the messages we had. It's where we pray for each other, help each other, support each other. So we want to invite you to please join a connect group. We have several groups. The leaders' numbers and names are on the board, on the screen. Please contact them and make sure that you join one of them. If you feel like you can be a leader of a life group, also let us know. We would love to chat to you and see how we can make that happen. All right, so those of you who have been with us for a while, why are we here? Love Key Church exists to have people encounter God, align with His purposes so they can reign in life and help others do the same. That is why we are here. If you want to be part of that, 
We'd love to invite you to bring an offer to serve. Let us know. You can sign up at the info table um, physically or online with a Google form. There's a QR code. There are many areas where you can come and help us out. Whatever you feel your gift is, or wherever you feel, man, I can help you, please come and let us know and you can be part of the teams. We are always building the teams. We have people in charge of every area and you can chat to those people. Zelda is your main contact and she will make sure you chat to the right people and you can also come and serve and be part of that. Um, while I'm thinking of that, I do want to invite you, if you can, come earlier on a Sunday. Come at quarter to nine because we do pre-service prayer at quarter to nine. And it's also a great way for you to just um, do some fellowship, meet some people and help us to prepare spiritually for the meeting that is to come. Amen. Amen. So please join us for that. All right. Amen. Next week, we um, have another visitor coming to our church. It's pa Pastor Anthony Liebenberg from Life Church Seapoint and also the guy who started Life Child, which is an amazing organization that help orphaned and vulnerable children here in Malawi, Mozambique and other places. I've been to some of their things and he's going to come and share a word to us about helping others when it comes to social justice. And he's also going to tell us a bit more of their project called Life Child. So please don't miss out on next week with Pastor Anthony Liebenberg visiting us. All right. I want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to everyone who has been faithfully tithing and bringing their offerings into the storehouse of God. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I stand in awe of your generosity and I want to honor you for that and thank you for that, for being obedient. Um, if, if I'm saying this and you go, that's not me, then just go speak to God. <laughs> go listen to the message on tithes and offerings where we spoke about the first fruits and, and let God speak to you and get the revelation. If you, if you still don't believe me, go and listen to the message where, where our sister Frances shared a word, uh, her testimony of how once she started tithing, the promotion she was waiting for for four years suddenly started, started coming through. And we can know that we, if we honor God with, and, and, and obey His word, then He is not a man that He should lie. His word is true. His promises will happen. So I want to uh, ask you, as the boxes go around, you can give cash, you can give through Snapscan or Zapper. There's EFT details on the website. However you want to give, ask God, what is it that I should give? The first fruits should be what you bring first to the house of God. Who had payday on the 25th? <laughs> nah, me. Who had payday? <laughs> All right. Who did you pay first? <laughs> Who got paid first? Did you bring your tithe to the storehouse first? Or was everyone else paid before you brought the, the tithe? That is a question we all have to ask ourselves every month or every week, however you are paid. Let's trust God for His increase. Let's trust God for what He's doing in our midst. And I want you to know that when you bring your tithe into the storehouse, as you are doing this, that is, this is also a way that we worship God, that mm. we praise God is by Amen. doing that, is by being obedient to His Word. Mm. And I want you to know that you're partnering with a ministry that is very serious about bringing the gospel to the lost, very serious about seeing marriages whole, families whole, very serious to see fatherlessness eradicated, mm. serious to see that we make a difference when it comes to people stuck in cultural Christianity. Mm. And we are sowing as a ministry into trusted organizations that are bringing the gospel to Jews and Arabs in the Middle East. Amen. That is what we believe and that's what we stand for. Mm -hmm. All right. I want us to, to pray together this morning before we go into our praise and worship. Um, it is, there's, as you may know, if you read the news, um, there's a lot going on in our world. Our world is a broken place. There is, you know, of the, the conflict in Ukraine. In our own nation, there's talk again of people rioting and looting and planning to do that in the coming week. What is true? What is exactly going to happen? Who knows? It feels like everyone is running some kind of propaganda scheme. But what we do know is that God's Word is true. God's Word is firm. And we can stand on that. And we will not fall for a spirit of fear. Because we've not been given a spirit of fear. We've been given a spirit of love peace and a sound mind and that is where we will stand and amen. pray and trust our God amen so I would like us to pray in this moment amen. for our church for each other I want us to pray for the things going on in the Ukraine and I want to pray for the peace of our nation so will you stand with me in agreement Lord this morning 
we bring our church before you. We thank you for this ministry. Lord, I pray that you bless us as you have already blessed us. Please let that increase. We pray for more of you. We pray for more, having a bigger footprint in the spiritual realm to bring an impact from heaven to this area that you have entrusted us with. We thank you for every life that has been already impacted, and we pray for more. Lord, I pray that you will protect me, my wife, our marriage, our family, and our children, and also the, the families that we have in this church and the individuals we have in this church. I pray your covering, your blessing, your protection, your anointing over each of us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I proclaim in the name of Jesus that this church is blessed, Amen. and this church is effective and in reaching people with the message of Jesus and for bringing life. Lord, thank you that we can be a life-giving church. Help us to stay a life-giving church that's Amen. always growing and making a positive impact for the church of Christ in this area. Lord, there's so many things that we can pray for this morning, but we want to specifically pray for the conflict that's raging right now in the Ukraine with Russia. We don't understand the whole picture. Lord, I've read up on this. There's different uh, opinions, but we know that you know what's going on. And I also know that there are people that love you in both of those nations. Lord, we pray that you will come into this situation and we pray for the peace in Ukraine. We pray for the peace in Russia. And we pray that the church of Christ in those nations will stand strong, will be protected, will take ground in this crisis time that the church will actually see growth and going from glory to glory. We pray your blessing over those nations, and we pray that you will bring a resolve, a supernatural resolve in the situation in Jesus' name. And Lord, we want to pray for our nation as well. There's murmurings and noises and, and, and talk of things, uh, uh, planning to, to bring unrest, planning to bring looting and rioting again in our nation. And we, Lord, we just come against that spirit right now in the name of Jesus. We do not accept it. We will not fall prey to it. And we will not be in fear over it. We, we say in the name of Jesus that, that any plan of the enemy is dismantled right now in this area. The Helderberg will be a place of peace and rest. We come against the spirit of violence. We resist you in the name of Jesus. And we declare that there will be peace in this area because you've placed us here and we will be your peacemakers, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God. We praise you and we worship you. Amen and amen. Let us stand. Let us stay standing. <laughs> and uh, we're going to read from the Word of God as we get into a time of worship. Thank you, Jesus. Let's read together from Psalm 145. I'm going to read verse 1 to 3 and verse 11 to 13. It says, I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure His greatness. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout the generations. The Lord always keeps His promises. He is gracious in all He does. Let's give God a big shout of praise. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. days of my life but a moment all that I treasure and hold even the breath that I breathe is not my own there's more to be gathered than riches more for the body than clothes the power to keep my life is yours alone
sparrows and lilies Upholding the earth day and night How could I feel when the Lord is on my side? My worry can add to your purpose My questions don't hinder your plan My future is held in the hollow of your hand Of your hand
on church This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you praise on yes we are made to praise the king of kings and the lord of lords let our bodies and our souls get in line come on jesus thank you lord to him look where we're standing now out of the wilderness into your deliverance look where I'm standing now these as who once were chained now lifted high in praise look where I'm standing now thank you Jesus Look where I'm standing now I stand on a chain breaking Miracle making Powerful name of Jesus On the body raising Prodigal saving Powerful name of Jesus Led by your mighty hand 
can get excited about where they're standing. You carry the cross for me. Now I am a child of the King. Oh, look where I'm standing now. Look where I'm standing now. I stand on the chain break, miracle make, powerful name of Jesus on the
the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus where he reveals what the kingdom of heaven is all about we know that he says seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all these other things will be added and he says when you are mine when you abide in me and my words abide in you then whatever you ask Whatever door you knock on, whatever you are looking for, it will be given, it will be opened. If you are asking, if you are seeking, and if you are knocking, and you're not getting the answers that you want, it may be time to go back to the question, do I put Him first? Do I seek His kingdom first because when my heart is aligned with his kingdom then when I pray I will pray kingdom things let's take a moment and just align our spirits with this and sing it one more time
will be, you will be fair. You will be fair. Oh, this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. Ask and he will. Yes, ask and he will. take a moment and ask that those things that you are asking and seeking and the doors that you are knocking on I want you to just take a moment and see in your in your spirit eyes how you just lay that before God and ask Jesus in what way am I not maybe aligned with you by putting you first Holy Spirit, show me now. And whatever He shows you, just repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't put you first in my marriage. I'm sorry I didn't put you first in terms of my work. I'm sorry I didn't put you first in terms of how I'm raising my children. I'm sorry for trusting, asking for, for, for material things when you are leading me to chase spiritual things. Just lay that all before Him. Ask Him to renew your mind, to renew the way you think. Ask Him to renew the desires of your heart to align with His desires. When we abide in Him and He abides in us, then our desires will become His desires. His desires will become our desires. And we will pray the will of the Father. Let's just take a moment and do that. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, we lay it all before you. We lay our will down. We lay our fleshly desires down. We want to be kingdom-minded. And now, let the Holy Spirit show you what are the things that you should be asking, seeking. What are the doors you should be knocking on? And expect that He will show you what that is and what that looks like. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We lay all these things before you, Lord. Help us to put you first. And always be kingdom-minded. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise that we have to give. We give you all the thanks that we have to give. It's all about you, Jesus. You are the king. You are the king. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. We adore you. We praise the beauty of your holiness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Turn to someone and tell them, God looks good on you. Church is going to be great. Wow. That was lacquer. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> How precious it is to be in God's presence. How amazing. I see the kids know by now, but yo, kids, you're allowed to go to kids' church. They're like, I couldn't wait anymore. Have a great time. All right. 
Thank you, Jesus. Wow, God is good. Amen. How many of you are still kind of hanging in that thing that happened last week with the with the Holy <laughs> Spirit? How was this week? Yo. And on the other hand, I don't know about you, but it also I also had experiences where it felt like the enemy wanted to come and steal what happened. I mean, wanted to come and go, no, it wasn't real, or no, what are you thinking? Or you catch yourself going back into an old habit. Yeah. That's this is this is the battle. This is the spiritual battle we're in. And we need to know that. So we are busy with a series called Helping Others, which is our church's main, fourth main value. Helping others to do what? Encounter God, align with His purposes in order to reign in life. That is what we are talking about. I spoke, the first message I did in this series was about the household of faith, that we should be good, especially to the household of faith, that we should love each other well. If we struggle to love each other well, if we struggle to have unity here, we will struggle to love the people outside of church that need to come into the kingdom. Amen? So we started there. Then Harvey preached a great message on what does it look like to, to be Christ in the workplace? What does it mean to help others meet God where we are in our workplace? And last week, um, we had Israel come and share with us what it means to have a heart for the lost. But he showed us, if you have the Holy Spirit, you will have a heart for the lost. And we were challenged, and we were blessed, and we were anointed, and it was just a powerful time. Today, the message that's on my heart to share with us is called Kingdom Culture. And it's where I believe God wants us to go. And we, but to go there, we need to know what kingdom culture looks like. And we also need to know what kingdom culture does not look like. Amen? All right. One of the main ways we help others is by sharing the gospel with them. Because that's the main first encounter we need to have with God is that moment where we go, I need Jesus, right? Um, and in doing so, we need to make sure that we do not share a watered-down, cheap version of the gospel. Did you know that in the States, the stats show that more people have gone, come to the front, to the altar, to give their lives to Jesus than there are people in the United States? What does that mean? People keep coming back because their conversions are not real. Because a cheap gospel was preached that didn't cut to the heart and make people repent for real. Amen? How many of you guys have heard of Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron? They've, they have a ministry called The Way of the Master. And I remember years ago watching the DVD series and it really challenging me. And in this week, someone sent me a link to an old message by Ray Comfort that's sort of the basis for that ministry, the, the sermon is called Hell's Best Kept Secret. And it reminded me of this, and I felt that was so timely because it ties in with what I want to share with you today. And according to his research, his understanding of the Bible, uh, it's the, the, the best kept secret from hell is basically that you can preach a gospel that makes people feel good and tells them, you know, just, just take Jesus and you will be happy and it will go well with you. Without the truth of if you don't have Jesus and the reality of sin, the finality of death and the reality of eternity not bringing that in, what we're doing is we are raising people that don't really know what it's about. And we don't want that. Satan doesn't want Christians to know is that true repentance and conversion only lies on the other side of a person having a deep revelation that he or she is indeed a sinner who is heading for an eternity of hell because they have broken God's law. This realization will convince them that they need to believe in, accept, and follow Jesus in order to spend eternity with God. If someone doesn't understand the seriousness and the severity of the consequences of sin and the wrath of God, they will not see why they need this Jesus that you're talking about. The example that Ray uses is 
Imagine you're on a plane, a normal commercial airline, and someone comes to you, one of the stewardesses, and says to you, here's a parachute. Put it on. It will improve your flight. And they give it to you. And you're like, that doesn't really make sense. But okay. And you put on the parachute. No one else is wearing a parachute around you. You are wearing a parachute. After a while, it gets uncomfortable. People are pointing, staring, and laughing at you. And, and then after a while, like, no, I don't need this. doesn't make sense. You take it off, you throw it away. But if that same stewardess comes to you with a parachute and a look on her face of, you need to listen to me now, this is serious. In about 10 minutes, our second engine of this plane is going to go out. And we are gonna be at, we're going to have to all jump in this 25,000 feet fall. Here's a parachute. What are you going to do? You're going to cling to that parachute. You don't care what it feels like. You don't care how uncomfortable it is. If someone laughs at you, you're going to go, I don't care. Because I need this parachute to not fall and go. But if we sell the gospel, that's like the first parachute. Just put it on. It'll improve your flight. Take on Jesus. It'll make your life better. People are going to go, my life's great. Why, why do I need this Jesus? We need to make sure that we understand that. Psalm 19 says that the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect in converting the soul. Father God, the Bible says, Father God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And therefore, when Jesus spoke to the people, he gave law to the ones that were proud. Remember the rich young ruler? He said, you know, how do I get to heaven? He says, keep the commandments. Because he saw the pride in the man's heart. He gave him law. The law was supposed to make him humble. And then he said to him, I've kept all the commandments. And then Jesus, okay, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. And then his real God was revealed, who is mammon, money. He's serving money. And then he, with a heavy heart, he walked away. He had, an, he had an encounter with Jesus, but his pride kept him away from the grace of Jesus. When, God, when Jesus gave the, the law and people were humbled by the law, or if they came to him with a humble disposition, immediately gave grace. Amen? I have been challenged by this approach myself, and I've asked myself whether I have ever tried to sell a cheap gospel just to get one more person to go to Jesus, to say yes to Jesus. But uh, so because if someone says yes to Jesus, but they don't really believe that they need Jesus, their salvation is either not real, which is terrible, or it's superficial and won't last long. And they will become another statistic of a backslider, which we don't want to see. Why am I sharing this? Because today we're talking about the message, kingdom culture. I actually wanted to call this message, the crisis of cultural Christianity. And those of you who have been here for a while, you'll know that this is something that God has laid on my heart to talk about. But instead of pointing out the negative, I felt the Holy Spirit lead me to rather put the, the goal where we should be going in front of us. Instead of focusing on what we should not be doing, we will focus on where we should be going as born-again followers of Christ. So I'm sharing this message because I'm convinced that too many people are church members only and not born-again, baptized, Holy Spirit-filled, Bible-believing followers of Christ. And we need to do something about it. And I believe it's because many of them have not really realized how serious the finality of death and the reality of eternity is. And one of the ways we can help others who are stuck in cultural Christianity is to help them see this, how serious it is. So today I'm going to try and do three things. I want us to identify what cultural Christianity is. We all need to be humble enough to make sure that we are not caught up in cultural Christianity or maybe some stuff that's stayed in our lives that we didn't even realize. Maybe I have some things I do or say 
that are not scriptural, but based on what people taught me. And then thirdly, I want us to look at how we can help others, because we're busy with helping others. We want to help others to recognize the fact that they are not truly born again, but blinded by false religion and the doctrine of men. So, yes, it's a difficult message. Some things I'm going to say today might upset you, may even offend you, but I want you to know that I'm going to tell you my story. I'm going to share a bit of my story of what I've learned and what I've seen. I'm going to refer to one specific traditional church, but this is true about many traditional churches, all right? I am not here to criticize a part of the body of Christ. That's not the point. The point is to say, what does the Bible say versus what are we doing, all right? So please understand that. It's to get clarity on what we are actually worshiping. So if at any point you feel that, ooh, that was a bit harsh or that was this or whatever, just know that it's coming from a place of seeing the truth for what it is. Amen. Are you with me? All right. So I was born into and raised in the culture of a fairly typical middle-class white Afrikaans Dutch Reformed church home environment. That's the culture that I grew up in. I think many of you here have the same story. Maybe it was AFM, maybe it was Hervormd or Gereformeerd or one of those, all right? Very few hands are going up, all right? <laughs> Do we have any uh, doppers in the house? People that grew up Gereformeerd. Let's see Gereformeerd, anyway. Now, I, had, I have a dopper grappy, but I'll leave it if there's no doppers in the house. My... <laughs> You know that the, the dopers believe you're not allowed, you can dance, but you're not allowed to enjoy it. Have <laughs> you heard that? All right. So, because they believe dancing leads to sex, so can't do it, okay? So, the, so there's the story, there's the story of this one dopper domini who was leaving the meeting. He was leaving a, a church council meeting, and he was heading home, and he saw this young couple in a phone booth kissing. And he thought, oh, that's not on. This is not okay. And he thought, okay, I'm going to go once around the block. And when I come back and they are still kissing, I'm going to say something. So he goes around the block once, comes back, prachtig, they are still kissing. Like, this is uncomfortable. Okay, I'm going to go around one more time. And he goes around the block and he comes and, oh, man, they are still kissing. So he stops. He feels this is his duty. He gets out of the car. He knocks on the booth. They open it up with these confused faces, and he says to them, you need to stop doing that. People are going to start thinking you're dancing. <laughs> these are some of the fun things that happen in cultural Christianity. <laughs> what I am grateful for is that in my home, I was taught there is a God. There is a Bible. You should go to church. This is right. This is wrong according to the Bible. And that I am grateful for. And I honor my parents for that. And I'm very grateful. And nothing of what I'm going to say after this will take away from that. Just please hear my heart. However, being born into this culture made me believe some things that stood in the way of me becoming born again. When I was 16, I was at a, a young Christian leaders camp. In other words, I thought I was a Christian because I was at a young leaders Christian camp. Myself and those around me really thought we are Christians and we are doing this for the right reasons. And our intentions were not evil. We, we really wanted to be part of this. I prayed, I read my Bible, I went to church, all that kind of stuff. But all of that was about to change on this camp. During worship on the Saturday, the worship leader told us, after we sang a few songs, he said, okay, I want you to close your eyes, just forget about everyone around you, and I want you to just focus on what I'm going to tell you. So I stood there, he said, okay, I want you to use your imagination. Now with me, you don't have to, my imagination is like, yes, it's excited. He says, I want you to, know, to see that you're walking through a forest, and he describes the trees and the little animals running around, and I mean, I was there, I was so there, before we had VR goggles, 
I, you know, imagination, I'm there. I'm walking through, through this amazing place. And then he goes into that for a while. Then he says, you come out of the forest into a clearing, open field. And on the other side of the field, there's this massive wall. Behind the wall is God. And he says, I'm going to leave you now, but I need you to ask the question, what is the wall? And how do you get to the other side? And I I, I mean, I was there. I saw this wall. I couldn't see where it ended, to the left or the right. I couldn't see how high it was. It was, I could, there was no way I could get around or over this wall. The next moment, the bricks in the wall turned into little demons that were laughing at me. And I just knew in an instant I'm a sinner. I have sin in my life. This is the wall between me and God. And in a very simple way, I just said, Lord, I'm I'm sorry for my sin. I want to be with you. And with that simple prayer of faith, that wall disappeared. And And as physically as you can feel something in the Spirit... I felt myself running into the arms of God the Father and holding me. And I could hear him say, I love you, my son. And I was wrecked. I was wrecked. I didn't know how much I needed to hear that. I didn't know how much I needed to hear those words. After that, we went down to the beach. The camp was at Kleinmont. When my feet hit the sand, there was this supernatural thing that came over me. I know now it was the Holy Spirit. I started running. I ran. I felt like I ran the fastest I've ever run in my whole life. And I just kept running and running and running and running until I was far away from everyone else. And then I just started worshiping God. I sang every worship song I knew. And then I started making up songs. I was just worshiping God. And something Something changed. I could feel that everything has changed. I was a new creation. And I didn't understand all of it. I did not. After that camp, camp, I, I had a sense that I was a new person. I was a new being. And I had this insatiable hunger for the Word of God and for more of Him. But I struggled to find it in the church environment that I was in. I felt like I kept hitting doors. I asked questions that weren't being answered or couldn't be answered or just telling me that's not part of who we are or whatever it might be. It was only much later in life. This was 16. Then in 2002, I did Idols. And after that, I won in June. A pastor phoned me in October, told me God spoke to him about me in March and said he must drink coffee with me and talk to me. And that man is Philip Pretorius. And I sat down with him for coffee, and he told me about discipleship. And when I heard what discipleship was, I was going like this, yeah, sure. And in my head, I was like, heck no. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to tell this guy what's really going on in my life. Because <laughs> I was a lone ranger Christian, and because I wasn't being discipled, because I wasn't solid in the Word of God, I had backslidden. The world had more influence on me than I had on the world. But before that moment, before I connected with this pastor, I felt like the culture I grew up in was like a veil. In a, in a, in a way, I guess I felt like Neo in The Matrix. How many of you guys saw The Matrix? The blue pool and the red pool, you know. What did Neo feel? He felt like what he's, his reality is not re- real. There's something else. There's something more. There's another dimension that is actually more real than the one he's experiencing. The Matrix movie is actually very spot on from a spiritual point of view. I was stuck for a long time because of the power of the doctrines of men, because of man-made rituals and traditions that are either not found in Scripture or they are contrary to Scripture. I'm going to list some of them to you here today. And this is the part where some people may get uncomfortable or angry. I'm sorry. But what I am doing is I'm holding up the Bible and I'm holding up the things we do. And we are going to see what measures up. 
All right? Okay. Please note, this is what I experienced. So I'm sharing testimonially. This is what I saw. And later in life, as I was discipled, read the Bible and compared, I was like, this doesn't measure up. It doesn't line up. All right? Okay. So firstly, through the culture that I grew up in, the message was either subliminal or very straight given that you don't need to be born again. It, it was not preached. It was not shared. It was not told. It was implied that if you go to church and you are born into a Christian family, you're fine. You're going to heaven. Second lie. Sprinkling a baby's head with water is baptism. It's not true. It's not the word of God. Third lie. There's no such thing as a Holy Spirit baptism. Lie number four, I was taught this in a youth leader class by a minister. Miracles were only for the time of the book of Acts. Jesus does not still heal today through his followers. I was taught that. Church is a building. Right? How many of you, without even thinking, you say we're going to church. And you're talking about a building. Amen? A church service should only be one hour long. And if it goes over, there will be, there will be people angry at the meeting with the Dominion. How could you go over your time? This is another one. You have to sit still and be quiet when you go to church. How many of you were pinched under, under the table? You're like, boss, your favorite Sit still. That was church. The doctrines, rules, and traditions of men are as important, if not more important, than the Word of God. You need to go to Sunday school to be able to be presented at 18 in church to accept the man-made rules of the church. If you don't do it, you can't get married in the church, and if you don't get married in the church, you can't baptize your baby whose name can't be on the list so that they can go through cat, uh, Sunday school and repeat the cycle all over again. Bowing to culture is more important than obeying the Word of God. We will overlook your sin and destructive habits as long as you attend church, give an offering. You can even serve as an elder or a deacon, no matter what your marriage looks like or how much you drank on Saturday. The idea is created that I need to first be perfect in order for God to accept me. How many of you guys were stuck in that place? And at the same time, though, you get the sense of sin is only sin if we tell you it's sin. And then they use the things they say is sin to make you feel guilty and ashamed. And they couple that with the fear of man in order to control people. Another lie is that the culture of the secular world around us and popular politics of the day is welcome in the church and will shape how we do things. After all, the Bible is old and can't be relevant to every situation we face in the modern day, right? Examples. Apartheid is wrong. No, sorry, apartheid is right? Oh, wait, no. Apartheid is wrong. They shifted. They first supported it. Then it became unpopular. Then they said, no, this is not right. Racism is wrong, but we have white churches, brown churches, black churches, Indian churches. Same-sex couples, same couples can get married and even become leaders in our church. But if you get baptized, we throw you out. People who want to get married are allowed to and even encouraged to live and sleep together before marriage. 
because it's more convenient, it's practical, makes sense. Sure, gender is fluid. Why limit us to just being male and female? Surely God was not serious when he led Moses to write Genesis. They argue that God's love allows these sins, but then they themselves have no love for those who follow the word of God regarding baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, and true signs and wonders done by Jesus through people. There is not a culture in general, this was my experience, of evangelism or a heart for the lost in our immediate community. Yes, we have a mission trip to India and to China, but in our immediate vicinity, what they will do is they will look after the sick and the widows and the orphans, which is amazing. But there's not a heart to reach the lost in our city. That was my experience. When I was 18, my parents wanted me to be presented in church with all the other 18-year-olds that went through Sunday school. I did not want to do it. By that time, I'd been saved for two years. I was like, I don't need to be presented. I'm saved. But the pressure, the, the social and cultural pressure was really strong. But it felt like a sham. Because I knew the kids that stood next to me. I knew what they did on the weekend and what they really believed. They didn't believe this. They were just doing it so that they can get married in the church and have their kids baptized in the church. But I did it to honor my parents. So I, I was standing there, but it was really difficult for me. There was this frustration in me. I struggled to be, in my own spiritual journey, I was struggling with sin and habitual sins, and things that I knew was wrong, but kept coming back, and I couldn't, I couldn't beat this. At the same time, but at least I knew it was wrong, but at the, and at the same time, I felt a holy discontent when I saw people who say they are Christians live exactly the same way as people in the world. And I was stuck because I felt, I can't say anything because I'm still working through stuff, but this can't be right. You know, I was in that headspace. But I thank God for sending Philip into my life at just the right time. And for every other leader after him and every other brother in Christ after him that was there when I needed them. That was there to slap me when I needed a slap. Be straight with me. Ask me, you know that when you meet someone or see them, you say, hey, how are you doing? And they go, oh, I'm well. Enough. And then after a few minutes you go, how are you really doing? How many of you hate that question? <laughs> I have men in my life that do that, go, how are you really doing? You need men in your life that go, how's your marriage? And if you're really lucky, they go to your wife and say, how's your marriage? And if she's not happy, they come to you. They go, hey. <laughs> Through these men, I learned what kingdom culture was supposed to look like. And I learned how to recognize when things I say and do are not based in or on the Word of God. But if it's based on culture, traditions, and the doctrines of men. This is why it's crucial for every born-again believer to know that God has to come first in their lives. This means the Word of God is the ultimate authority in your life. It means that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and you treat it as such. It means that church comes first before your social life. It means that we need to create and adopt a, a God's kingdom culture in every area of our life. Now, of course, we need to be aware and humble enough to recognize that with a new church plant, we can even create things that become our culture that we start to make up and it's not necessarily in line with God's word. And I, and I want to be weary of that. I want to be careful of that. And, and if anyone sees anything that's not in line with God's word, you are free to come and talk to us about it, all right? Because we don't want to fall in the same trap. Because for thousands of years, there have been churches, and many have fallen in the same trap. And I'm not criticizing because I think we've arrived and we have the answer. A church that says we have the answer and no one else is right is a church that is a sect, and they think they have the answer. No. The body of Christ has many members, and we all have a role to play. But the question is, are we playing our role according to the Scriptures or according to one man's opinion or a few men's opinion? That's what we need to be careful for. 
My story that I shared with you today of what I experienced is just one example. Millions of people around the world are born into the Roman Catholic culture. It's apparently it's like 2.1 billion people are officially Roman Catholic. They worship Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they believe a priest must hear their confession. They must pay him in order for them to receive forgiveness. This is not scriptural. Here in South Africa, we have the Zionists, the biggest church in South Africa. If you Google biggest Christian church South Africa, you get the Zionists. But they worship their forefathers and go, yeah, sure, we'll pray to Jesus as well. He's a forefather. So they mix it up. We have the Pinkster tradition, which I've, I love my, my, my colored brothers and sisters. I've been to their churches, and it's, it's fun. If, if any of you have been to one of those churches, they, they do a thing called jaych. They jaych. They put on this fast-paced music, and then everybody is in front doing this. And it's fun. It's great. If it's for the Lord. If it's about Him. But I've been in, in, in situations where I could see this is for show. This is, it's, a, it's a cultural, traditional thing that has become more important than the focus of our worship. And that's a danger that can happen in any culture. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm showing these as examples. I'm not showing them as an exhaustive list. There are many in all cultures we, we see this happening. I just wanted to show you that it's not just about Afrikaans, Dutch reform. It's not just there. It can happen anywhere. So let us ask ourselves, what culture did you grow up in? What culture did you grow up in? And how has it shaped your picture of God, of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit? And how has it shaped your understanding of the Word of God and its place in your life? Ask yourself, am I truly born again? Or do I just accept that my culture will get me into heaven? How many of you guys were in that place where I was at? I thought, just doing, going through the motions gets me to heaven. Because my parents believe I will go to heaven. Who, who thought that? Okay. So, let's, let's try to get to the point. What is cultural Christianity? What is it? The key to understanding this is the key, uh, is actually what we discussed in our first series. The first commandment tells us that we shall not worship any other gods besides the living God. Are you in agreement? Good, you're in agreement with the Word of God. The second, the second commandment says that you shall not make or create anything else to worship. All right? When we create an image of God that suits us, that's convenient to us, and we choose how we're going to worship this God, and we make it a part of our daily lives, i.e. our culture, we are creating a false God that's a product of the figment of our imagination. And then we choose to worship this idol. Have you ever heard people say, no, but my God will never do that? Really? Have you met your God? Is your God alive? My God is a holy God. Because He is good, because He is righteous, because He is justice, there are consequences to choices in life. Yes, He loves you deeply. That is why He came in human form to show us the heart of the Father, the reality of eternity, and say, I want to warn you, not threaten you, warn you that if you don't realize where you are heading without me, you will end up there. And that's very real and very serious. But this is what happens in cultural Christianity. People define God in a way that suits them and make up traditions and, and, and all kinds of rituals, make it and they fuse it with their culture, and then they worship their culture. How do you know when someone is a cultural Christian? One of the ways I've recognized this is you can use the name of the Lord in vain in front of them. You can blaspheme, or they will even blaspheme, and it's not a problem. It's just normal 
This is just part of how I speak. But when you say something negative about their culture or an important figure in their culture or their favorite song, they will take you out, man. Very specific example. You can, there's a, there are places in this nation where if you blaspheme, they won't blink an eye. But if you take on Steve Hofmeyer, they will throw you out. They will. Because he is their God. What he says goes. I'm not, I'm not here to knock Steve. I know Steve. But for some people, he is God. And we have to be careful of these things. Who are you, who are you worshiping? How do I know? Now, this is a question we have to ask ourselves. How do I know that I'm free of these things we've just talked about? Am I free of cultural Christianity? How do I know I'm truly born again? Paul says we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Do you have a moment that you know where you were confronted with the finality of death and the reality of eternity and that your choice in this life, whether you surrendered your life to Jesus or not, will determine where you spend eternity? And then you willingly chose to repent of your sin and receive the grace, the free gift of grace that God has given us through Jesus' sacrifice and know that this paid the ransom that I actually need to pay. And did you change after that decision? If you are really honest, was there a change? If you can answer yes to this, then you are truly born again. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But you may need to ask the Holy Spirit and your friends and leaders whether they can spot any habits or patterns of thinking that are still maybe linked to the culture you were born into. Hear my heart. Culture is not bad. Language is not bad. God gave us culture and language and whatever. But once we are born again, that is not our first form of identity. It's not, our, it's not what we base our identity on. And if there is anything in your culture that is contrary to the Word of God, it has to go. It has to go. Otherwise, you are still worshiping your culture. If you ever find yourself justifying something you're doing that you know is not in line with God's Word, but you're going, yeah, but... I had a moment this morning, with, I'm just going to say with one of my children, where he was disobedient and he tried to hide it from me. And when I confronted him about it, he had a justification. He had a reason, but it was a weak one. And I pointed it out to him and I asked him, do you know that this was wrong? Yes. Yes. Are you sorry? Yes. Okay, I forgive you. But we had to have that moment. And that's the thing. The law of God is perfect in converting the soul. Am I letting it do its work? Am I letting the law of God make me realize I can't do this without Jesus? So how do we help if you are now convinced that you are born again and you're in a good place with Jesus. Great. Okay, now, how do we help cultural Christians to snap out of it? How do we give them, which one is the one that changed Neo, the blue or the red? I forget. The right pill. <laughs> the gospel. Um, so I'm going to share some ideas based on what I've seen works when you are speaking to someone that comes from that background. Uh, from the start, I just want to say, I forgot to write this down, but I'm, as I'm standing here, I just feel the Holy Spirit remind me. Nothing will beat your personal testimony. When you speak to someone, you realize they are actually, they say they are a Christian, okay? They go to church, they go through all the motions, but you pick up in how they speak and, and the language they use, the things they do, they're not really born again. This is not about judging. This is about recognizing and lovingly helping someone to true salvation, all right? So if you, if you notice these things, just share your, there's nothing better than me sharing my personal testimony because I was a cultural Christian. So I can tell them, this is my story. Okay, now once I've told the story, I can ask them what it is that they believe. Now, they will tell you, I'm a Christian, okay? It's cool. Now, I want to know, 
Do you get excited about going to church? And you do it like that, like, huh? huh? You get excited about going to church? Do you get excited about reading the Word of God and praying? And they will go like, they look at you like you're crazy. This is, no. It's boring. It's stiff. And I just do it because I have to. That's typically the response that you will get. Do you feel joy when you sing in church? No. Okay. Now, when they say no, ask them, why do they go? Why do you go? If it's that boring and stiff and there's no life, why, why do you go? They will probably answer you in some way that's going to be indicative of the fact that they do it out of habit, out of culture. You can make up whatever that might be. Now, ask them, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? They will say yes, because they will feel that's the right answer. Okay. Now, ask them, why did Jesus die on a cross? Why? They will hopefully be able to tell you it was to save the lost. And then you can ask, okay, to save the lost. Who helps him to do that? His disciples, okay? Then you ask them, do you know Matthew 28 verse 19? They probably won't because the average cultural Christian don't actually know the word of God that well. They just listen to the duomini and then they go home. Some of them will, some won't. You tell them, it says, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them what I've taught you. And then you ask them, so if you believe the Bible is true, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross for the lost, and that he gave us a mission, how is it going with your mission? How many people have you led to Jesus, baptized, and taught Jesus' ways? They will get uncomfortable. Because they probably have done none of that. And even now as I'm asking these questions, I sense that some of you are even a bit like, uncomfortable with that question. All right? Good. Then you can take it up a notch and say, okay, so according to Mark 16, which is Mark's version of the, the Great Commission, you ask them, so how many sick people, demon-possessed people, and dead people have you prayed for? And how many of them stood up healthy? They will look at you like you have completely lost the plot. But that should be normal for a Christian. So then ask them, ask them again, why are you a Christian and why do you go to church? What's the point? Then it gets really uncomfortable. Now, depending on how this goes, <laughs> You can also ask them what they believe baptism is. Many people will get very upset with me about this, and we've had some debates even in my own family. But baptism, in my opinion, is one of the best ways the enemy has kept the traditional churches back from being more powerful in the Spirit and changing the world for Jesus. This is key. This is so key. How many of you guys were baptized last week? Did you sense that massive change? Did you sense that something shifted in the spirit? Yes. It cannot happen to a baby. It is impossible. The Bible says that up until the age of accountability, God has grace. The age of accountability is 12, 13. From that point, you are responsible for where you go. You have to make a choice, and the choice for Jesus must be followed with baptism. Now, ask a cultural Christian about baptism. They're going to tell you, I was baptized as a baby. And what they mean is that they were presented by their parents in front of the church, and water was sprinkled on their head. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that. Nowhere. What you do find is Jesus as a baby being presented by his parents to the priest in the church. He was dedicated. He was prayed over, prophesied over. Yes, we dedicate babies. You don't baptize a baby. And guys, please, get this out of your vocabulary. There's no such thing as small doop, klein doop, and groot doop. There's no such thing as small baptism and big baptism. 
There's one baptism. Go read Ephesians 4. What happens there is not baptism. So you can't define it by saying small baptism. No, it's not baptism. If we don't get this right, the enemy will always come in with an angle because we compromise and compromise and compromise to please people, and then eventually the truth suffers. Now, now that you've spoken about baptism and they go, okay, you ask them, where does it say in the Bible you should baptize a baby? They won't be able to answer you. They're going to say that Dwemini says this or whatever. They don't really know. Then, now you can gently show them that they don't really believe the Word of God. You asked them that in the beginning. Do you believe the Word of God? Good. Now you showed them you, you don't. Are you, are you, can you see that you actually don't believe the Word of God? Hopefully by now, the law of the Lord would have made them humble enough to admit that, and you start getting a gap. You can also point out to them that they are, can you see that you're actually putting more weight on what people say you should do? Man-made doctrines, man-made rules and traditions. The way you sit, the way you walk, the way you come into church, the way you dress, the way we do this and that. How does it measure up with the Word of God? Ask them now, do you think you're going to heaven? They'll probably say yes. Now ask them, why do they think they will? They'll probably get something along the lines of, well, God loves me. I love God. And I'm a good person. And, and the way they define good person, and by the way, you'll find this with people in the world as well. This is in the, they'll say I'm a good person. Why? Well, I don't murder. I don't kill and I don't. They list the bad stuff they don't do to say how good they are. Now ask them whether they've kept the Ten Commandments. This comes back to that way of the master thing. Have you kept the Ten Commandments? And they will go, yeah, I think so. You say, have you ever told a lie, even a small one? They'll go, yeah. Say, okay, what does that make you? A liar? People don't want to say that. They hate saying that. It makes me a liar. Oh, man. Then you go, okay, have you ever stolen anything? Even if it was a small thing, like maybe as a child you took someone's rubber away or you took someone's pencil. Yeah? What does that make you? And then they go, I'm not a thief. You just told me you stole something. That makes you a thief. <gasps> it's a very uncomfortable conversation. Then you tell them, you know, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus came and he said, if you look with lust on a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. Have you looked with lust? They'll go, yeah, okay. So what are you? An adulterer. Oh, okay. Then you, the, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not commit murder. Jesus says, Moses told you you shall not commit murder, but I tell you, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder in your heart. Have you committed murder? Have you hated someone? Yes. What does that make you? A murderer. And then you say, so by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, murdering, adulterer at heart. And you will have to face God on the day of judgment. How are you feeling now about your chances getting into heaven? Some of us are uncomfortable right now, right? Because we also realize, shucks, I'm also a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart, and I need to face God on judgment day. <laughs> This is the law of God. What does it do? What is the point of the law of God? It is to show us how far we fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, is what Paul writes in Romans. It includes us. But what is the good news? Hopefully by now, this cultural Christian will be so moved by what has just happened, that they will be humbled and say, like when Peter preached after the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit fell and he preached to the, and those were Jews. He was preaching to Jews about their God. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart and said, what do we do? And he said to them, repent, be baptized, join the local church. And that's what happened. And this is what you say to a cultural Christian, 
to someone who's in the world that don't have, have no idea of religion, the same thing. When they come to this point of humbling themselves, saying, shucks, I don't want to... I don't want to face God on my own, with my own strength. I can never keep these commandments. Why do you think Jesus came and said that it's not just adultery, it's when you look. It's not just murder, it's when you hate in your heart. Why? He came to show us the heart of the Ten Commandments and that it's impossible for us to do it on our own strength. He came and showed us how much we need Him. Amen? We can't do this on our own. It takes humility, though, to, re- to realize that and to truly repent. And then you lead them to, say, to repent to God and to accept Him as their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then you encourage them to be baptized with water, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and to join a local church, this one if it's in the area. And then we get them to connect and we get them to be discipled because that's where we all need to go. We all need to ask ourselves this question, who do I worship? Do I worship God or do I worship the the things that people tell me to worship? Is the God that I'm worshiping, this is important, is the God that I'm worshiping the living God of the Word? Is it Him? Or is it some construct of my imagination? Because then you're serving a false God. Let's not do that. I still have so much to share with you, but I see it's already 10 past 11. But I want to quickly just mention this to you because it's, and it's just a bit of a vulnerable moment for me. When God spoke to me about planting this church, it started where I knew that this was coming was when I woke up two mornings in a row and I said, Lord, show me what I must read in your word today. And the first morning, he, he gave me Hosea 4. From verse 1 to 6. Many people quote, I think it's verse 5. The the well-known verse, it says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Have you heard that? People quote that. But you don't often hear the context. The context here is God is saying, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore, the land will mourn. There are consequences to breaking the law of God. And everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beat beast of the field and the birds of the air and then he goes on to say therefore you shall stumble in the day the prophet also shall stumble with you in the night and i will destroy your mother this is the bible my people listen to this my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and then it says because you have rejected knowledge i also will reject you from being priest for me God is actually speaking to the spiritual leader of the day. And I read this, and I was cut to the heart. Because I realized if I get this responsibility to lead a church, I have to speak the truth. I have to bring the knowledge of God to the people so that they don't perish because of a lack of knowledge. People, listen to me. There are millions of people perishing because they are stuck in cultural Christianity. They are not saved. They think they are, and that's the worst part of it. They think they're going to heaven, but they're not. You heard what Israel said last week as well. We have to be confronted with this. And I know What I'm saying today, a lot of the things I said today will probably blow up in my face in some way. Someone will have something to say or email me or whatever it might be. But if I don't, God's going to hold me responsible for not sharing the truth. I want you all to not perish Mm. because of a lack of knowledge.
The other scripture that God gave me is from Ezekiel 3, the morning after that. It speaks of how he tells Ezekiel to eat the scroll, the word of God. And then he says to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech or of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people whose words you cannot understand you. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like an adamant stone, harder than flint, I've made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your heart all my words that I speak to you, and hear with your ears, and go, get to the captives, to the children of your people, and speak to them, and tell them, thus says the Lord, whether they hear or whether they refuse. In these verses, God confirmed something He had already deposited in my heart. We can't mess around with the truth of God's Word. We can't allow any of this stuff to stand in the way. And I've got news that you may not want to hear, but because God has put me in as the leader of this church and you guys are in this church the mission is not just mine we all have this mission we all need to be hard headed in the spirit we all need to have a bit of a thicker skin because people won't like when we speak the truth the Bible says Jesus is a cornerstone for those who believe but a stumbling stone and a rock of offense for those who don't believe and that includes cultural Christians who are not saved. Whenever I speak to a group of people, when I was in Richards Bay recently, God showed me this very clearly. He said to me, tell them you're speaking to two groups of people only. Born again believers and the rest. And in the rest, there's people that think they are Christians, but they're not. And they need to hear that. It's not to judge. It's not to make you feel bad. It's to, it's to lovingly warn you that you may be believing stuff that's not true and to invite you into the kingdom of God. Amen? What does the kingdom culture look like that God wants us to be in? Colossians 3 from verse 1. It says, If then you were raised with Christ. How many of you are raised with Christ? If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, which lines up with seek first the kingdom. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. That includes people's ri ri rituals and traditions. It's earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Therefore, what does your life look like? Put to death these things, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Then he goes on and says, put these things off as well. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, Filthy language. How many Christians do you know that use filthy language? All the time. They sound exactly the way the world sounds. Do not lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with its deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now, what do we do? I want to skip down. It says, the elect of God, the chosen ones of God, Put on holiness, beloved. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. What does this sound like? My first sermon in this series, Galatians 5. 
fruit of the Spirit versus works of the flesh. There's the kingdom of God, and then there's the rest. We are in the kingdom of God. Let us walk as children of the light. I want us to stand and just close our eyes and respond to this word. If any one of you today has had a deep realization that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, maybe the questions I ask cut you to the heart and you are humbled by them. I want to give you an opportunity to respond today by saying, yes, Jesus, I want, I don't want to just grab a parachute because someone told me it's a good idea. I want to grab hold of you because you are life. You are life eternal. If that's you today, won't you raise your hand and say, say, I want to give my life to Christ. Anyone like that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here today and you've walked with God, you are, you are born again, but today maybe you realize, man, there's some stuff that I'm still stuck in, some traditions and rituals and things that I believe, and I don't want to be stuck in that. If that's you today, just raise your hand as well. Let's respond to this moment. If there's anything you feel, I need to get rid of this stuff. Thank you, Jesus. All right, I'm going to pray with those who raise their hands. And then we're going to ask Holy Spirit to give us all just a touch of His presence. All right. So let us all pray. Can I ask those two people to come to the front, please, before we pray? Let's honor God and acknowledge God before others. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I saw one more hand. Where's that other hand? Come, brother. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Dirk, I'm just, I'm hearing these words that we also heard last week. With your lips, you honor me, but your heart is far from me. But I feel God is saying today, my son, by standing up and coming forward, I know that you've come home. And I will restore. I will restore and I will renew and I will strengthen. Not condemnation, not condemnation, not condemnation, not guilt, not shame. We cancel that right now. Just Holy Spirit conviction. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your freedom, your freedom, your freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Do you have a, a child that is lost? They are not living for God and you want them to make their life right. I'm just sensing there's a prodigal child. Okay. Mm. Is there a part of you that, that part of your resistance maybe to have given your life to God is because you don't think you're, you feel God should have done something or change something or fix something. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. But you are here to give your life to Christ, right? All right. So you can only give what you have. Okay. So if, if you take this today, you can give that to your child. All right. Is it a son? A son? All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Pray this after me. We can all pray this together. All right. Lord Jesus. Come on, out loud. Lord Jesus. 
Today I choose to make you Lord of my life. I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. But today I become born again. I become born of God. I am a new creation. Jesus, you are my king. I lay down my life. I lay down my will. And I choose to do your will. From this day forward, Holy Spirit, fill me, strengthen me, help me to live the supernatural life that you've called me to live. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. I want us to all stretch out our faith to God. And I, I, I believe that we all need almost like a Holy Spirit injection of boldness. So that when we get into those conversations, we will not shy away from the truth of the Word of God. That we will boldly be who we are in Christ. Amen? Okay. I want you to open your hands like you're going to receive something because I believe we will receive something right now. Just be expectant. Okay. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you will touch every person in this place right now and those who are watching online or listening later, that you will come now in this moment and just touch them, Lord. I pray that they will receive power to be witnesses to you, power of the Holy Spirit, touching every heart, touching every life right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that you free us all from anything that's not of your word and that you bless us with a boldness to go forth and share your truth, your love with conviction and boldness as we speak to others. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, for a special anointing on this house to help cultural Christians to realize they need to be born again. They need to be baptized because that's what your word says. And I pray that you will help all of us to be able to share that. I pray for encounters with people in the weeks to come and testimonies to flow from this house of how people's lives are changed. Lord, you are king and we are here to follow you. Help us to be vigilant to not allow any man-made things to come into our midst, but that we will always just choose to honor you and follow your word. We pray that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Sunday. Please stay, have coffee, have fellowship, hang around. Have a wonderful Sunday. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.